Good morning, everyone. It is wonderful to have you all joining us here at Good Shepherd United Church of Christ on this Labor Day weekend. We will be remembering Labor Day during our pastoral prayer this morning. We will also be blessing our school bags and backpacks today during the service as part of the children's moment. If you are a child and watching this before 9 a.m. on Sunday morning, a reminder that I will be in, in back in the parking lot of the church to bless your bags in person if you wish and to hand out a small token so you can remember God's blessing for this upcoming school year. As always, we have a couple thank yous. First to Mike Leiser, who is our camera person and sound person for these services. And this morning we are also blessed to have Chelsea joining us as one of our vocalists on the hymns. Next Sunday, we will have communion as part of the service. So as always, we invite you to find a piece of bread or a cracker or a pretzel and a cup of juice or wine or water to celebrate with us virtually. Again, I will be out back next Sunday morning to celebrate communion with anyone who wishes to do that with a pastor between 9 and 10 in the morning. With all of that being said, I invite us to be in a spirit of worship and focus our hearts and minds on God. Let us pray. Holy One, where two or three are gathered, you have promised to be. 
Awaken us to your presence in this moment. Connect us across time and space in our worship. Sustain us through our prayers. Renew us through our listening. Refresh us through the music and words we offer. Amen. Let us confess our sins before God. Merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you. Our conscience reminds us of all the missteps we have made and of all the times we have not followed your will for our lives. For these times, we ask your forgiveness, trusting in your grace for our lives. Restore us and set us on the right path once again so that we may proclaim, become proclaimers of your kingdom to the world around us. Amen. Christ Jesus has helped us lay aside our sin. We have confessed our sins. Now let us receive God's forgiveness. Be renewed and be at peace. Amen. As we do each week, we ask you to take just but a few moments to think of those you would sit near or talk to each Sunday. Take a moment to pray for them. Take a moment to consider calling them this week. Even as we maintain physical distance from each other, let us strengthen our communal and spiritual connection to one another.
Amen. This is the moment each week we ask all of the children to join us. And this week I want to bless each one of you as you are back at school. And perhaps you're feeling a little bit nervous. Maybe you're happy to be back at school. If you happen to be a teacher watching this, I want to bless you as well during these moments. I have my bag here. It isn't my school bag, but it's my work bag. And on it is the tag that I'm going to send or give each one of you. And the tag has the word shalom on it. And that word we might not know, but shalom is a Hebrew word that means peace. And the verse on this tag is from Philippians chapter 4. It says, do not worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank God for all God has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. God's peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. Now I invite you to go get your school bag. Maybe go get your computer if you're learning online. You can pause the video if you need to. And come back and we're going to bless those objects. Let us pray. Oh God, today we gather to bless a new school year. This year brings many feelings for us. We are nervous. We miss our friends. We don't know our teachers really well yet. And yet we are eager to learn new things. When we have so many feelings in our bodies, help us to know it is okay to talk about them when they are too much. And give us someone to talk to when we need it. God of knowledge and wisdom, we also pray to you for all of the schools, that they may be places of learning, places of new discovery, places that we pursue goodness, even as teachers teach on the internet and in different ways. As students begin the year, give them open hearts and minds to learn and experience. Despite the challenges and differences, may they be enriched by their education time. Enable them to grow in knowledge and wisdom during the school year and all the days of their lives. Bless all who teach as well. Give, we give you thanks for their diligence, their resilience, their adaptability in the face of unique challenges. Bless all the other school staff and administrators, all of the office personnel, all seeking to do their best and educate children. And now, O oh God, bless our backpacks, our book bags, our briefcases, our totes. Bless the books and the computers that they carry, that they may become tools of vibrant learning and discovery. Bless the students, the teachers, and the workers who carry them, Keep them safe from harm and disease. In the name of Christ Jesus, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever, we pray. Amen. Amen. Come see me Sunday if you want to. If not, I will send you each a tag for your bags. God bless. I miss each one of you. This scripture reading from Matthew's gospel is often read as a guide to church discipline. Yet it is more than that. Jesus lays forth principles not just for righting a wrong, but for building the Christian community into a powerful witness. As we listen to this passage, may we consider how we can witness to the world around us, even when we don't agree with each other. 
If another member of the church sins against you, go and point out the fault when the two of you are alone. Even if the member, if the member listens to you, you have regained that one. But if you are not listened to, take one or two others along with you, so that every word may be confirmed by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If the member refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if the offender refuses to listen to even the church, let that one be to you as a Gentile and tax collector. Truly, I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly, I tell you, if two of you agree on earth about anything you ask, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. For the word of the Lord, inspired by the Spirit, thanks be to God. Often, we hear today's gospel passage as only being about one thing, church discipline. Thus, this passage only feels applicable to debates or when someone steps out of line in church. And when it comes to the main line Protestants, this, church, this passage doesn't feel all that relevant. We don't really do church discipline as most people think of it, and we haven't excommunicated anyone in probably at least a century. While this passage may have something to say in unlikely situations, we tend to struggle with how it impacts us in our day-to-day -day lives. However, if we are able to extend the focus a bit. At the heart of this passage are principles that are relevant to how we live our lives every day and especially in the church. This passage speaks directly to how we are community together in the church. 
Read by itself, we may misunderstand the point of these six short verses. This passage is primarily not about discipline, but about how we choose to dwell together in the church, even when, and especially when, inevitable disagreements arise. It is less about correcting an error and more about maintaining the bonds of community. Part of the reason we lose the depth of this passage is because so often we only read it in isolation, thanks to our assigned lectionary readings. From just the lectionary reading, it seems straightforward. The process laid out seems clear. When a problem arises, when someone sins against us, Jesus instructs us to begin by confronting them alone. And if they listen and apologize, the matter is over. If not, the next step is to go with a few others to resolve the matter. And if that doesn't work, only then do other people get involved. The whole church is to be involved. And if the offender does not listen to the whole church, then the person is removed from the body of the fellowship. To read this passage, it seems so clear-cut. Someone has clearly sinned and an offense is known. The steps to resolution are laid out. If they don't repent and apologize, they are asked or told to leave. And it's over. Doesn't it seem so logical? And yet, we know that offenses and disagreements are rarely logical or clear. There is rarely only one right side of an issue or an argument. This passage is not meant to be read in isolation from the rest of the chapter, nor from the rest of the gospel as a whole. This passage on church discipline only comes after Jesus has spoken at length about embracing humility in the kingdom of God. He tells the disciples they must become like children and not seek greatness. Jesus also speaks about not putting, <clears throat> not putting stumbling blocks in front of people. And he speaks about how heaven rejoices when one lost sheep is found. Jesus even speaks about avoiding sin for ourselves. And immediately after this passage, Jesus and Peter, Peter speak at length about the need for radical forgiveness above all else. Taken together, this entire chapter is not about discipline, but about grace, love, and community. Read in context, this passage is about is less about getting them over there to repent and apologize or leave, and more about our own gratitude and attitude as Christians and about the strength of the Christian community as a whole. It is about the principles that make us the body of Christ. When we read this passage closely, it offers us a dose of humility and a challenge. Jesus' wisdom seems counterintuitive to our human nature. Often, when we feel wrong, the last thing we do is go and talk to the person who we think has wronged us. We are more apt to talk to our friends or someone else rather than the person directly. And I even think the idea of a small group next is a bit of a check and a call to humility. The two or three other witnesses mentioned can, yes, back you up, but they can also be a balance to your own opinion. While not explicitly in there, often another point of view can put things into perspective for us. 
Sometimes we realize that a- that anger or hurt that we are holding on to is not justified. Sometimes that other person can help us frame things in a way that the one we think has offended us is able to hear us better. Finally, even Jesus' ultimate solution is not what we expect it to be. When Jesus says you should treat them like a Gentile or tax collector, that doesn't mean that we kick them out and we're done with them, but rather that they are the very people that we should focus on for ministering to by the gospel's standards. Jesus himself spent a whole lot of time eating and talking to Gentiles and tax collectors. Rather than distancing himself from them, these were the very people that Jesus was closest to. What a humility check for us to look at that person that we are mad at, that person who has hurt us, and see not an enemy, but the person we need to be nicest towards. To see in that person the one that God is calling us to reach out towards and minister to as Christian witnesses can be challenging and humbling. The vision for Christian community that is put forth in this text is not just limited to the idea of an invitational community where the outsider is the one consistently invited in, but it is also envisioned by the verb that is so frequently used in this short passage. Time and time again in this passage, Jesus speaks about listening. Listening can mean many things, but within this passage, it is listening that seeks understanding. Listening in such a way that we might even come around to agreeing with the other's point of view. While it is rarely that easy, this text is a powerful reminder to take time to listen to someone, especially if they are the one approaching us seeking to explain a hurt they experienced. This text is a challenge for us to listen to someone who says to us that we have wronged them, especially if others are saying the same thing. Listen and be willing to apologize. It is easy to be convinced of our own point of view and correctness in the situation. It is hard to examine ourselves and admit that we may have been wrong or admit that we have erred. It is hard to apologize when we are the ones who have lost our temper, when we are the ones who have hurt someone. The final reminder of the power of Christian community comes from the very last verse in this passage. Again, it is often one that is lifted out of its context. When Jesus says, where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them, we read it solely in context of gathering for worship. Yet in context of this passage, it frames our discussions around discipline, around confronting sin, and around our interactions in general. How different might our interactions be with one another if we acknowledged that God was present in every moment? You know, often we make decisions or do something. We get into a discussion and even arguments with another in the church, and I do think that God is a disinterested observer in what we're doing, or that God will somehow bless whatever decisions we make. How would our community be different if we imagined that God and Jesus Christ were an integral part of everything that we were doing? 
What if rather than ask God to bless our opinions, we prayed for God's will first? What if we took seriously the idea that we as the church are the body of Christ? What if we lived out that belief that Christ's presence, Christ's will, and Christ's love were to be fused into our very natures? What would be different if we approached our lives together this way? Imagining such an outlook is no easy task. And even though it is difficult, let it not stop us from trying. Let us endeavor to live out an approach that not so much confronts sin and hurt, but seeks to build community and preach the gospel in all things. Let us be a community that seeks to love God with our heart, soul, and mind, and love our neighbors as ourselves. And then, no matter what comes to us, we will preach the gospel with our love for one another. Whether we agree with the decisions made or not, whether someone gets angry at us or we at them, may we remain committed to the blessed fellowship and the blessed community that defines the church of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Let us be in a spirit of prayer for all who labor. Holy God, you have commanded us to work in order to meet our needs. Sanctify our labor that it may bring nourishment to our souls as well as to our bodies. May our work be guided by your light and by your hand. Make us faithful to the callings for which you have bestowed upon us the necessary gifts, taking from us any envy or jealousy at the vocations of others. Give us a good heart to supply the needs of the poor. Save us from any desire to exalt ourselves over those who receive our bounty. Above all, may every temporal grace be matched by spiritual grace that in both body and soul we may live to your glory. And we pray as well, not only for those who labor, but for those who cannot work right now, those looking for jobs and finding none, those whose bodies will not allow them to work. We pray for those whose jobs do not bring fulfillment, those whose jobs do not match their callings. We pray for those who labor with illness and those who labor with grief. We pray for those who labor with concerns we do not know about. And most of all, we pray for all of us that we may labor for your kingdom to become reality here on earth. For all of our prayers, spoken and unspoken, we pray using the words that Jesus himself taught us, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. What is it we can offer our fellow Christians? Time, talent, treasure, the gift of forgiveness to one who may have hurt us. Whatever it is we may offer, let us take time to co contemplate that as we li listen to our offertory this morning.
Let us pray together our prayer of dedication. Generous God, through Jesus you gave us abundant grace and call us to love our neighbors as ourselves. You have asked us to share our resources, so we offer up to you our gifts for the building of your kingdom. Accept the gifts we bring and help us to spread your love. Amen. As we go from here, remember God's presence is always with us. And all that we do and all that we say, may we proclaim grace for one another. Be slow to anger and quick to forgive. In everything, testify to God's love made known in Christ Jesus. Amen and amen.